Welcome to Take Command, a Dale Carnegie podcast, the show where we seek to uncover what leadership means in today's world. I'm Joe Hart, CEO of Dale Carnegie, and we will be talking to diverse leaders with stories to tell across various industries to help unlock your potential for success. We will be sharing real life insights into leadership, which in turn can help spark the next level of your growth as a leader. Today's guest has achieved extraordinary things in professional sports, business, media, philanthropy, and in his personal life. He is a National Baseball Hall of Famer, a 12-time All-Star with over 3,100 hits and 465 home runs, and he hit the game-winning run in the 1992 World Series. He's active in numerous businesses. He has served on multiple boards, including Hackensack Medical Center and Morehouse School of Medicine, and his philanthropic efforts have supported thousands of people around the world. We are excited to welcome the one and only Dave Winfield. Dave Winfield, welcome to the Take Command podcast. Joe Hart, thank you very much. Glad to see you today and glad to speak to you once again. It really is outstanding to have you. You're someone I mentioned that I have watched and admired over the years. Many people have called you one of the greatest athletes of all time. Certainly from a baseball standpoint, you're a legend, 12-time all-star baseball player, 3,110 hits, 465 home runs, game-winning run in the 1992 World Series. I mean, you've had this incredible career in business and philanthropy. So I know that I and our listeners are going to have much to learn from you today. I was excited when you asked me to do this. I had to think. I had to go back and think about so many of the things that I've done. You know, COVID has cut back a lot of opportunities to speak to people. So this is a great opportunity to share some of my uh, experiences, wisdom, hopefully motivation for others. Well, I'm looking forward to getting to know you better and having our listeners get to know you better. You're from St. Paul, Minnesota. You're born and raised. Share a little bit about your background and, you know, kind of the early days that led to your career. Well, I grew up on an um, interesting day in baseball history. You people have heard many times, the Giants win the pennant, the Giants win the pennant. And then my name is Win and Field. So perhaps, you know, October 3rd, 1951 was kind of an appropriate day to be born and then have a career in sports as I did. But I grew up in St. Paul, Minnesota. My parents were uh, divorced when I was a youngster. And uh, my mother raised my brother and myself. We had close-knit family close by. We didn't have a lot of money and didn't travel a whole lot, but it was a loving, caring family and uh, gave me great guidance. And I think it helped make me, mold me to the person I am today. I know your mom really had a formative impact on who you are and your values. You've talked about your mother. Share a little bit about how she affected who you are today. It's funny because over the last weekend, I found a videotape. She had passed away in 1988. It was her last year of life, but she was with me when we donated some books to a library and she did an interview and it was fond memories because she instilled my character, who I am. I went well beyond anything that she ever accomplished in life. But every time she would talk to me, it was give it a hundred percent and I love you. And she was always proud and supported my brother, Steve, and myself. I think she was the foundation, the rock of our life. You know, I give her so much credit. She was only five foot two and a half. And she had two big old boys walking next to her. And she didn't need us to have friends or um, things of that nature. She was just a great individual. You're a parent. I'm a parent. Sometimes we forget just how important the role is that we have. We go through the day-to-day, but certainly she was someone I know who had instilled the values in you that you are. You were always involved in athletics. It's interesting, though, I learned you actually were drafted from college into football, baseball, and basketball. You picked baseball, but you were outstanding at basketball, both in high school and college. Yes, I'm one of the few people, when I finished the University of Minnesota, I was drafted by the Minnesota Vikings, by the Atlanta Hawks in basketball, and the Utah Stars. They had ABA and then the San Diego Padres. And at the time, I thought a lot of it. It was nice, but no one hence has done that. So uh, I'm kind of in a category of my own, a unicorn, if you will. But I chose the right sport, professional baseball. Played 22 years, 
both leagues, both coasts, both countries, won championships, accomplished all that I set out to do. And if I have any regrets, the only thing, they didn't let me pitch, not one day in the major leagues. They said, you're just a hitter. That's it. You were a phenomenal pitcher in college. You pitched a number of shutouts. You pitched in the College World Series. It was only later that people recognized you and realized you were a phenomenal hitter. It's something that I did my whole life until I went to the University of Minnesota. And they said, we just want you to pitch. And I would go away in the summer and play and do well hitting. I said, last year, coach, come on, let me hit. And he did. And I was, like I said, MVP of the College World Series. And then I ended up having a career just as a hitter. So that's a whole story in itself. But it worked out. So Dave, what drove you? You're playing basketball, you're playing baseball constantly. What drove you to that success and to that approach? That's a great question. When I would play sports, I would listen to the coach. I would give it the best that I had every day. It was just me. It took me a long way. I developed in ways that no one had seen. I wasn't like blessed being the tallest, strongest athlete from day one. It wasn't that way. When I played a sport, I gave it everything I had and positive things resulted through bad coaches, through good coaches. I developed as an individual, physically, mentally. You know, a kid from St. Paul, Minnesota, it wasn't like I was destined to be the Dave Winfield you know today. I just worked at it, and it evolved, and good things happened. You had kind of this inner drive. You kept getting better and better. I know that we talked, and you believe strongly in personal growth, continuous improvement. What advice do you have? I mean, you must have seen players that didn't have that, and they had talent, but they may not have had that drive. What are ways that you've seen, how do you encourage people to kind of be more motivated to really bring out their best? How do you coach people to be their best? Well, you can coach some, some will accept advice and some won't. I remember even at the professional level, there were guys who were afraid of the challenge in front of them. To be more precise, we're going to face Tom Seaver today or Bob Gibson as a pitcher, or Steve Carlton. They said, oh, my fingernail hurts today. Oh, my back is a little stiff. So they were never up for the challenge. And I remember just saying, if I don't face the best, how am I ever going to be all that I can be? And the people that never were up for the challenge, they ended up having part-time roles, shortened careers, smaller expectations, and they didn't have the same kind of career. So sometimes you have to walk through that door face your fears, deal with these challenges, and then that's the only way you'll find out what's inside of you. Did you ever have those fears? I mean, you must have had fears like everyone else has fears. I mean, how did you face your fears? How did you get yourself over any of the hurdles you might have experienced from a fear standpoint? Well, in the beginning, I think some might have been some false confidence because you haven't been there before. Bob Gibson was one of my heroes. He was a Hall of Fame pitcher. He was pinned on my wall before I turned professional. Turned professional, I was going to play against him one day. I met him personally in the store. I didn't know that he didn't interact with people on other teams. It was basically, I introduced myself and there was a grunt. I said, whoa. I said, next to, he didn't extend his hand or anything. I said, when I face this guy, I'm going to get him. And I remember the first time I faced him, he struck me out. And the next time I got up, there were men on base. We were down and I hit a home run and I took my time around the bases, looked at him all the way, walked across home plate, pointed at him and said, I'm here too. And the next time I came up, two pitches were thrown at my head. However, (laughs) I I was very quick on my feet. The thing is, it was one of those things that showed me maybe I do belong. And then I went to my first all-star game. And I looked around and I see all of the people who were my heroes and I fantasized about being there. And I said, maybe I belong. And then I gained comfort. And then I was able to just respond and participate and contribute in different ways, but with much more confidence. So a lot of people, I think, who listen to our podcast, Dave, at different stages of their careers, certainly people who are earlier in their careers can have that exact same feeling that you just talked about, which is do I belong? I talked to my daughter the other day, new in a job and you're new in anything. You're just like, gosh, you know, what do I know? How do I contribute and so forth? But there's that lack of confidence. It sounds like maybe you had a little of that just in the early stages, probably like we all do. What advice would you have for people to build that confidence so that they can bring out their best the way that you did? 
Well, sometimes it comes from knowledge, reading. There were three things that helped me grow as a person, even when I'd have conversations with people, they say, well, he knows a little bit. So I would read. So I continued to read and then I would travel. I began to travel the world. I'd see different cultures. I'd see different architecture. I'd see different food and people and customs, just meeting new people and not being afraid to strike up a conversation. I've had family members say, you sat on the plane for three hours talking to that person. What were you talking about? I said, do you know this was truly a rocket scientist? I met the pilot of the last space shuttle and we talked and I asked them, I was curious. I asked questions. I asked them a question. What does space smell like? That's a crazy question. What did he but say? He said, it's kind of like a, a freezer. It's almost like an iron smell. It was hard to describe to him, but he said, no one's ever asked me that before. I said, I just thought of it, man. And I wanted to ask you. So I was always curious. And I said, read, travel, meet new people. It expanded my horizons exponentially. So once I was in a room, I was more comfortable being able to be convivial and have a discussion with people from wide range of backgrounds. Continue to do it to this day. It's a great lesson, which is, you know, we can build our confidence, but by learning, by preparing, I mean, in some sense, you know, you prepare yourself, you grow. And then when you have an experience like you did and you have a good conversation, you get more confident and that type of thing. What were some of the books that inspired you? Yeah, we talked a little earlier and the books that really made an impact on me, there were things like the biographies or autobiographies of athletes, like a Sandy Koufax or Hank Greenberg, uh, Henry Aaron. But there were books for personal improvement, things like As a Man Thinketh by James Allen, or The Greatest Salesman in the World, Og Mandino, Psycho-Cybernetics, Maxwell Maltz, and then, of course, Dale Carnegie. There were a couple of videos that I would watch. There was a guy named Jim Rohn who was very kind of homespun, but basic principles of decency, honesty, preparation, thoughtfulness, and, you know, I just began to incorporate a lot of that into my life. So it started with books like that. And then I'll tell you, even watching the series Roots, it caused me to say, you know what? I'm going to look into my background as an African-American. I took my first trip to West Africa, where I found out that some of my roots and my heritage came from. And it changed my life. And the studies in this area and the knowledge of where I am from. I've studied ancestry. All of that has helped make me who I am today. Tell us a little bit more about that. What did it mean to you? How did it shape you? To think back hundreds of years where this is where some of, uh, I began in some of the roots, you know, and you've heard that saying, deeper the roots are more prolific, the branches. I just thought about, man, this is where some of my people came from And what was it like to be taken against your will to another country? And they were there, these slave castles. I'd go in this slave castle and you would look out this door, they called Door of No Return. And you'd see a vast expanse of water, which was the Atlantic Ocean. And then you're shackled and you're taken to some place that you couldn't even dream of for a life, horrible life that you couldn't imagine. And so you know, it'd bring tears to your eyes and you see these small spaces and you just think of what was it like? And part of it was like, if I am here today, there are people in my background who survived some of the most vile, rough, turbulent times that anyone could imagine. And if I'm here today, I can make it through tough times as well. People asked me when I went through some of the most difficult times when I was playing ball, There were just everything, injuries, lawsuits, people come after you because they think you have money. There were just people dying in my family, passing on accidents. They said, how do you make it through these difficult times? And when I was injured one year, I jotted down, I called it 40 reasons for strength. It just came out. There were about 40 different things that I latched on to that when at times were most difficult that I said I relied upon. And so I wrote them in a book that I did called Winning It All, Inning by Inning, 
you know, some of the things I had to get out of my system because I didn't really think about it, but sometimes I have to think about it, write it down, and then speak about it. A lot of times it comes into existence. And that's the sequence that I go through. It's great that you've shared those things. And thank you for sharing just the powerful experience that you had and what it meant to you. You were talking about adversity mm. and, you know, life has adversity. Certainly we all go through it. What advice might you offer people about how to face adversities? How are some ways that you have faced adversity and gotten through those? And certainly these days, these times are adverse times going through COVID and all the different challenges around that. Oh, yeah. Well, we're here talking today about leadership. And there are a lot of great people and great athletes, but you wouldn't call them leaders. And many times you have to go through adversity to really be respected or really achieve all that you can be. I think of some of the things that got me through it, the family's love and support, spiritual belief, my stature and my career and my community. I wasn't going to let anybody tear me down. I was a parent. I want my respect. All the work that I did in the community through my foundation couldn't be taken away. My heritage, African-American man, and then uh, other people's success that I read about, that was motivation for me. I'd have a sharp focus on what I was doing, and maybe that came over time. But my desire to leave a positive legacy in life. I'm not done yet, so I'm not going to let anyone prevent me from getting where I plan to go. That's a really important thing you talked about in your Hall of Fame induction speech about you want to you know give to others and would love to hear more about that. I mean, so is that something you've always felt? Is that something that's developed over time? You know, what has inspired you to be focused on giving? Well, Joe, it was always a part of me. My mom always gave to others, whether it was the church or to people who had less than us. Minnesota seemed to be a state where I was always here. Major corporations would contribute a part of what they make. And then when I first made it as a professional athlete, and no one else was doing this, but this was one of the first things that I did. We created a scholarship fund called the Winfield Awards in St. Paul. It's still going today. It's 47 years old, but it was for minority student athletes. And if they could emulate or follow in the footsteps of me, not only athletic, academic, and community work, that was something that I would do. So that's a longstanding part of me. It represents me well. And then I was creative and bold enough to say, I'm going to create a, my own nonprofit operating foundation, 501c3, when I start making a little bit more money. And then people would always join in because they follow athletes. I kind of envisioned myself as a Pied Piper. If I was an athlete and I played well and I gave back, people followed. I was kind of building that leadership. It wasn't about money. It wasn't about fame. It was just about what I felt that I could do while I'm here on this earth, make my contributions in different ways. And I was way ahead of my time. And I was the first, there was no one else. I'm not like the pioneer across in America. They say manifest destiny. We're going across. And man, those are the people that got the arrows and the slings and everything else. I heard all kinds of things, but I proceeded because that's what I believed. Well, even going back, I mean, your first team you played with was the San Diego Padres. And as I understand it, you started just buying tickets and creating a section of the outfield where you were giving away tickets. They called it the Winfield Pavilion, right? I mean, so you were giving right out of the box. I mean, really the earliest stages of your career just to help people come and enjoy the game. And I mean, you gave, I don't know how many, probably thousands of tickets over there. Oh, yeah, yeah. We started with the tickets and then uh, it wouldn't be but a couple of weeks later, I'd come up with something else. You know, I had the idea for the All-Star game. It was my second All-Star game. And it was in San Diego. First was in New York, second in San Diego. And everybody said, Dave, Dave, how can we get tickets in it? And I couldn't buy tickets for everybody. You know, All-Star game was a little bit more. However, I said, we're going to create a party for all the kids of San Diego. And then I asked the Padres to open up the gates of the ballpark to let people in and watch us have batting practice. See, nowadays you see a week-long festival. But what we did back in 1978 spurred the thinking of Major League Baseball on a scale. They said, hey, why don't we do this? And then they started opening the gates in successive All-Star games, but they would charge 
you know, money. So first they gave it to charity. Then they said, we're the charity. They keep it themselves. And now it is a week long festival. But my creativity was one of those things. You planted a seed, took people to games, had relationships with hospitals and school systems and for non-invasive exams and giving them computers and drug prevention. So I was creative and bold and people would say, what is this guy doing? But I would make sure that I was a very good player because I always thought they only listen to people who are hitting about 280, 300. If I'm hitting 210, I might not get any followers. <laughs> so that was part of leadership too. So it motivated me as well. Well, one thing that I take away from this and that inspires me certainly is that we can always do things for other people at any stage of our career. It could be big or small. You had the idea to open up the ballpark. You had the idea to buy seats for kids who might not otherwise be able to go to a game. But what can we do as leaders really to make the lives of people around us better? There's no reason we can't do the small things or big things, depending on what our roles are. Oh, absolutely. I mean, people ask me, even in an era of a lot of inequality and a lot of things that are happening out there, I just tell people, you can make a contribution. And you said it, I'm just saying it another way. Wherever you are, whatever you do, how much you have, there's always something you can do for others. So I'm not going to tell people just one thing, uh, be a volunteer with this organization or make a contribution to this group. Whoever you are, whatever you're involved in, you can make a difference in other people's lives the direction of your family, your community, your organization, or your country. We can all do something. The ironic thing is, I'm sure you probably found this to be true too, is that it feels like no matter how much you give, you always feel like you get more back. You do something nice for someone and there's a satisfaction that comes back two or threefold sometimes. No doubt, no doubt. And you never know when, where, or how it comes back. Even on a small scale, I remember as my twins, they're now 27, when they were very young and throughout their life, we'd go somewhere or do something and maybe a door wasn't open or opportunity wasn't there. And next thing you know, there's a tap on the shoulder, Winfield family, we can get you on this airplane that, you know, <laughs> because I love what your dad did for, it, it wasn't about, oh, we hit 465 home runs. It was always, you know, he helped my cousin with a scholarship to go to SUNY, you know, college back in New York City back in 1984. It's like, whoa. So I have been blessed with so many responses to things that I've done to unknown people and known people as well. I look now, one of the people that won one of the uh, Winfield Awards in Minnesota is the mayor of St. Paul, Minnesota, Melvin Carter. He got a stipend to go to Florida A&M. You know, his career and life began in that respect. There's so many more that just turned out to be great citizens, but I feel good about it. And it's the great thing, too. When you help someone, like you said, you don't know where that's going to go. You also make the distinction between achievement. People can achieve things, and then there's contribution. I want to ask you more about leadership. I know it's a Please. topic that's passionate about. Before I do, I've got to ask you a little bit about baseball. Not that they're mutually exclusive. They're not. But you played for six teams. You had a very illustrious career. As you look back on that career, are there one or two things that stand out as, you know, kind of either defining moments or main parts of your career that really make you proud or that you learn from? There are a lot of individual awards that I won. As a career starts, you never know what you're going to do. You could just have an average career in terms of numbers or earning capacity or length of career. So you never know. Once I started winning some awards or becoming an all-star, all these were great. I got to 3,000 hits. That was great. Winning the World Series was the pinnacle for me because it was done as a team. As an athlete, I mean, there's a lot of people that can make contributions, put up great numbers. But when you're part of a group and you show leadership and help people reach the pinnacle of success, they are forever your brothers in this game. They may not have been the greatest in the world. There were so many times I sat with guys that just having conversations with them, bolstering their confidence, a pat on the back because they made a contribution. But winning that World Series 
in 1992 in Toronto, where it wasn't for a city or a state or a region, but a whole country. That was the pinnacle. Absolutely. It's interesting, though, as you reflect upon that experience, you're thinking also about just the connection with the people. I mean, the teamwork that you have is about helping each other out, building each other out, working as one team. As you said, it was a whole team. You happened to hit that winning hit. And at the same time, it's the team coming together and the contribution we made together. So Dave, you're in the World Series. The game's yeah, on really. the line. You stand up to bat. There are two outs and you're looking at this pitcher. I can't imagine the nervousness you must have felt. How did you keep your mental toughness in that moment to then be able to hit the game-winning double? Almost 10 years, 11 years before that, we had a World Series we didn't win, and I didn't play well. I just say I didn't get the results, I imagine. I was able to win at every level of play, from youth baseball to high school to college and professional, and you feel you're going to carry on the tradition. You prepare the same way. You don't take it for granted. A lot of confidence, and sometimes you don't get the results that you anticipate. So here I am 11 years later, and I get that opportunity once again. The way I prepared for it was to block out all distractions. No one could call my house. No one could ask me for tickets. They had to go through my wife, and they didn't really want to do that. <laughs> Those that did who were met with, you'll have to find your own way. There was some white noise in my headsets. I didn't want to be distracted by noise, words, images, anything else. I knew I prepared myself the best way I could physically, mentally, and didn't let anyone distract. The opportunity came up again. I said, here's my chance. More than a decade later, three, two count. Here's the pitch. Bam, base hit. I know what other people in the stands are thinking. I try to keep that out, block it out. But when I got a hit and the ball went by the infielder and the runs came around the bases and I stood on second base, the visitor's ballpark, 50,000 people quiet, maybe 1,000 people cheering for us. Threw myself back when I was a youngster. And that's where I would end practice. Men on base, game on the line, 3-2 count. You get the hit. That's the way you end your practice. You don't end on, well, I swung and missed and struck out, took the bat back to the dugout. That's not the way I ended my practices throughout life. So I was able to get to what I envisioned some 30 years before, 20 years before, 10 years before. And I had given it my best every day that I performed as a professional, yet I had not reached the pinnacle of success, but there it was. Well, you achieved an incredible thing, not only in that game, in your career. I'm just struck by the fact that in many ways, you'd been preparing for that at bat for decades, that focus, that mental preparation. And that's something that all of us can do too, as we think about whether we meditate or prepare ourselves or build ourselves up or whatever it is, but we visualize ourselves in that position where we're winning. It's a powerful story. And thank you for sharing it. I had a 22 year career. I'm the same person, but the first two thirds of my career were not what I anticipated, not what I expected. It was very difficult, made that way by forces that I didn't imagine. When the last third of my career and the last four teams I played for turned my career around. So I had that endurance and I had the mental toughness to get past some of the worst times in my life. The places that I went and the people I met and the mental focus and toughness, I continued to perform at a level seen early, middle part to my career. I took it to the last third of my career because I knew it was important to establish my legacy, what I wanted it to be. But it took the last third of my career where I could leave the game happy, satisfied, accomplished. I overcame the hurdles, the stumbling blocks, the negativity, the very, very tough times 
to make it to that last third. Well, it's inspiring too, because I think sometimes people don't realize all the hurdles that we have to overcome. And certainly you overcame that endurance, that perseverance is often what wins the race or in your case, you know, helps you cement just a phenomenal baseball legacy. Dave, how would you define leadership? If you were to put leadership in a couple of sentences, what would you say leadership is to you? I thought about this. There is no way that you can condense it into one sentence. And I'm going to come to you from the direction of an athlete. In sports, it's a combination of action, accomplishments, your attitude, techniques. You have to have the talent and you have to go through some things where when you come out the other side, people respect you, believe in you, listen to you, follow you. So there's one thing that inspires or activates people to allow you to be called a leader and they follow. And it's not something that you call yourself. You have to earn it. After you've been through enough, sometimes you are appointed. And that happened to me. You're the captain of the team. And that was good and bad because, you know, when the team didn't do well, I said, hey, Babe Ruth couldn't captain this ship. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Sometimes. But I always gave it my all and people listened. And when you're accomplished and you give back and you make others better, all those go into leadership. So that is well beyond a sentence or two. But that's how it works in sports. Well, you know, one thing that struck me that I think goes into leadership, your definition of leadership, I watched your acceptance speech being inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame. And it struck me that you spent the vast majority of that speech thanking and recognizing other people. You thanked and recognized other players, other coaches, people who've been inspiring to you. And that got me thinking about humility, you know, because a lot of times, I mean, this is a moment, it struck me that there was humility in that you're saying, hey, look, you know, I've achieved this. There's all these other people who really, you know, share in this to some degree. Where does humility tie into leadership from your standpoint? In my speech, it's funny, all the guys behind me, my heroes and stuff, speed it up, Dave, speed it up. You know, but I said, hey, look, I have this podium one time and I'm going to give credit to the people who helped me get there. I was on the shoulders of many others before me where times weren't so great, opportunity wasn't so great. I overcame tremendous obstacles. There were people that helped me through these difficult times and I was going to give them credit. And I did from my coaches, teachers, family, business people who believed in me. And I gave them credit because I know I didn't do it all myself. No one achieves the heights of so-called quote unquote success by themselves. They're delusional if they think they did it themselves. So it's always important to give people that credit, whether it's a business or a project and you are a leader, you are a manager, you are CEO, give other people credit, give them the recognition they deserve and you'll always get more in return. It's a great philosophy and it's really true. When people think that they achieve things on their own, it is delusional, right? It's arrogant because all of us, achieve whatever we achieve in part because of the other people who help support us. And like you said, when you give credit like that, I think that also builds that view of people wanting to follow you as a leader. I mean, certainly that was a great speech that you gave. Well, I appreciate that very much. And, you know, you get one shot at it and uh, I gave it my best. I was at the outer limits of length, but that's all right. I took my time and I'm very happy. Well, you talked in that speech about three points that you really took from your experience. You talked about values and character, continuous learning, and self-improvement. Share your thoughts on those with our listeners, if you would. Continuous learning. I can recall from the time that I finished at the University of Minnesota, and I was trying to learn the game of baseball at its highest level. I would take my yellow pad out. I had a yellow pad at home. I still write down everything, my thoughts, and I would always learn. How do I improve and become the best? Continuous learning. The guys on the team would sometimes laugh at me. I would take books on road trip in my briefcase. They'd laugh at me, they'd scoff at me, overcoming obstacles. I worked for one of the toughest, and sometimes I could say the worst, employer in the history of baseball. It was very combative. I worked in New York for 10 years 
there were not many happy days. I always know that I would have been that much better with a pat on the back or support and never got it once in 10 years. And so if you can overcome that and all the attacks and lawsuits and things that athletes face, if you can overcome that, leadership will emerge if you can make it through these times. And the last part was uh, oh, values and character. I think there were three things that made me make sure I was going to stay on a path of positive things in life. I was with a friend of mine. We were driving around and he saw an article at a hardware store. He said, let's take that, put it in his car. There was a police incident. That was one thing that bad things happened. The next thing I was with the University of Minnesota, and this was a team thing. Team got into an altercation and all of our guys, you know, against another team. And we got a lot of the bad press and positioning. It was 50 years ago. Some of the guys still hear about it today. And the third thing was a friend of mine, it was a roommate for a while, was killed in a robbery. I look at these things after one thing I said, I don't want anything like this to ever happen again. The second one, I said, that's two strikes. If the three, man, <laughs> you know, in baseball, you might be out. And then the last thing, a friend was killed in a robbery of his own doing. And I said that I am going to take a path, a positive approach to life. My legacy will not be associated with any of those things. I will just say there was a young pastor I just heard just the other day, and I saw him on TV two days ago for the first time, and I got his book. It's called Wrong Lanes Have Right Turns. And I said, how appropriate is that? You could be going down a wrong lane, but you can get an off-ramp and do other things. That was a good way to say some things that I experienced in life. Thank you for sharing that. I know it's very personal. You've made so many contributions and you continue to. So Dave, one thing that you've said is that if you don't have communication skills, you can only go so far. Yes. Well, it's true. Certainly, if you're trying to get a job, no matter how qualified you are, and if you can't express yourself, what you've done or what you uh, expect to achieve, you have limitations. Also, you could have accomplished some of the greatest things in the world. And if you cannot inspire others, express to others how they can be better, it's just not understood. Your achievements will be lost in the sands of history or whatever the case may be. But I just thought communication skills are extremely important. And it's not only talking to people, but positioning your company. How do you write and how you get across your ideas? They're critical in this day and age. And most people are not very good at that. They just aren't. And it holds them back. It definitely does. One of the things that strikes me about you is you're also a great listener. You're inquisitive. You're curious. You've talked about times you have had conversations with people and just listened for hours and really learned from them. That's just the way we learn. We have two ears and a one mouth, I guess. So <laughs> we're supposed to listen twice as long. So Dave, you've got some advice around leadership. There's five specific things that you talk about. Would you share that with our listeners if you would? Yes. You know, over time, as I've expressed, I've always tried to find ways to improve myself and share it with others. I talk to many coaches, successful businessmen, world travelers, Hall of Famers, people who have accomplished great things. And there seem to be common denominator across the board. So I call it five levels from really aspiration to achievement. And the first level is everyone has God-given ability. And some people find that or know what it is and try to enhance it and get better. If you're in sports, you know, some people have better eyesight or hand-eye coordination, fast twitch muscle fibers, endurance, whatever the case may be, that is your baseline. The next level is in any industry, but we'll start with sports, but it could be in anything. You have to know the rules, techniques, fundamentals, laws of whatever you are partaking in. If you're a basketball coach and you don't know that you have a certain amount of timeouts, someone can beat you. So in your industry, and I'd say sports, 
You have to know the infield fly rule in baseball. Otherwise, someone's going to beat you. The next one is purposeful practice or preparation. If you just go about your uh, preparation in a half-baked way, when the game is on the line, the fourth quarter, everything's in front of you, you're not going to be able to come through because you didn't practice that way. So you've never reached that level of preparation. You'll never be as good as you can be. The fourth level, physical fitness. If you are unfit, you don't have endurance, you don't have strength, it's going to affect you mentally, it's going to affect your ability to be around for the long haul. And the last level is mental toughness. I came up with these five levels years and years ago, but today it's much more apparent. People are now even talking about mental wellness. Some people push themselves too far. As much as I've been through, somehow I made it through the gauntlet, through the swamp, through the quicksand and came out the other side. It's a broad issue, but if you don't have mental toughness, you cannot perform against the top people in the game. So all of those things, starting with God-given ability, know the rules, laws, techniques, fundamentals, purposeful practice, physical fitness, and the last one, mental toughness. What are some of the things that excite you today and excite you about the future? Well, I'm fortunate to be working with the uh, Major League Baseball Players Association. I'm an advisor to the executive director, and I'm in touch with all the players all the time. A couple of the things that are most important in my life, my charitable work through my Winfield Foundation, and the other is working with the Major League Baseball Players Association and helping guys, even though we work, people look at, oh, they're all millionaires, they're all rich. It's not the case. Even people that can earn money need representation. And the players used to have little or no representation. And I came at a time where that representation began and players could now have a career. They don't have to have two jobs. They don't have to be homeless for 30 years before they could reach a pension. I'll put it this way. I told a couple of young guys at an executive board meeting this past winter, I said, what makes me proud to be able to work with you guys in the history of Major League Baseball, they have numbers associated with them. And I was like 9,500. But I said, since I finished playing and since I was there, made my contribution, 10,000 players have come after me. They have a better opportunity than I had and the people of my era. And not only for the player, but their families. And it's not just local, regional, domestic, but internationally. And I'm very happy to have made an impact to change the course of direction of the, your ability to have a career and a life through playing professional baseball. And so that excites me. I'll continue to do that. On the personal side, I am involved in some business opportunities now that I hope to share the academic the financial or economic successes with other people who will come after me. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Dave. Do you have any parting advice for our listeners? I appreciate just the platform, the opportunity to speak to people in a way that I haven't spoken to people in a while. Just knowing we were going to speak about leadership today made me go back and think about and research a lot of things in my life that I really wanted to share with people today. So I'm glad I were able to do that. I appreciate the platform, continue the great work. And as I told you before, Dale Carnegie and those principles had an impact on my life as well. Much appreciated. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you, Dave. Great to be with you today. I hope you enjoyed this edition of Take Command, the Dale Carnegie podcast. Check out our resources page at www.dalecarnegie.com for more research, insight, and tools that will support your success in taking command of your leadership potential. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider rating it and subscribing to us on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. As always, thank you for listening. And we look forward to you joining us at the next episode of Take Command, a Dale Carnegie podcast.